Welcome to Real Talk with Re, the podcast that dives into the real and sometimes raw topics of motherhood. I'm your host, Re, from mummyof4.com. Here we talk about the issues we face from overwhelm and the comparison trap to finding ways to make our lives easier and be happier every day. We discuss tips and strategies to help us be the best versions of ourselves so that we can be the most amazing role models and show up for our families. So if you're ready to have real conversations, learn, laugh, cry and grow together, this is the place for you. Let's get to it. Hi guys, Re here from mummyof4.com. Welcome to another episode of Real Talk with Re. Thank you so much for joining me, whether it be on YouTube, in that case, hi, I'm waving at you, or on your favorite podcasting provider. So today we're going to be answering a lot of questions about autism in general. I am a parent of children with autism and I just want to throw it out that I'm not a doctor. I am not qualified. I'm not an expert. I am just talking from my own experience and the situations I've faced with my own children, strategies that we use. So obviously not everything is going to apply to every child, every person with autism. It is by very nature a spectrum, ASD, autism spectrum disorder. <laughs> Can't be speak. That's a good start, isn't it? So it's a spectrum. Not everything is going to apply to everyone. I just kind of wanted to throw that disclaimer out there. And also where you live in the country or indeed the world, the assessment criteria may differ and the way in which the waiting lists are set up may differ. So if you have any concerns at all about your child, family member, yourself, then speak to your GP in your area and they'll point you in the right direction, whether that will be through the medical system, through the school system, where assessments need to take place. So again, I'm just going to talk from my own experience. But we're going to get started with the first question, which is how do the, my children feel about having autism? And it's very matter of fact. It's very, very matter of fact indeed, because that's how I've kind of explained it to them. So my children don't have uh, learning difficulties, as I would like in an academic sense. So autism can come with other difficulties, uh, but academically, my children don't really struggle. That's not where their struggles lie. So I just explained it to them that everyone has their own challenges and the way that autism works for them is while some of their friends might struggle with maths or spelling, then their struggles are going to be different. They're going to be more like struggling with changes of routine or queuing or dealing with something unexpected or having to sit and do the homework even though they're more than capable of actually doing the physical work the act of having to sit and do the homework may be more challenging for them so that's how I've explained it to my kids and I feel that that kind of is what it is really that I don't think there's any human on this planet that doesn't struggle with something and whether that's you know, anxiety or whether that's struggling with dyslexia or struggling with maths or for me, for example, like, I don't know why this is, what what this says about my brain. My biggest struggle, um, I cannot hold directions in my head. If you start saying to me, right, you go down the road, then you turn left. I, I just zone out. It's like, blah, 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 blah. Like there's something about directions that does, it's like, geographic dyslexia honestly it's just but everyone has their own challenges so whether um people's challenges have a diagnostic term or it's just something that they find hard then that's the best way of explaining it to them so i hope that makes sense um and the children are all very they're in they're all very like (laughs) they're in the little club of uh so 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 and so has autism like us then yeah so i've explained about some people are neurotypical and some people have autism and you know it's some people don't know if they're neurotypical or have autism and it's just a slightly different way of thinking slightly different way of of wiring your brain um and yes that's so that makes sense to them and that they're pretty cool about it um did you tell your kids they were being assessed um right so with will who was my so I got four kids. If you if you're not familiar with me, hi by the way. If this is the first time we're meeting, um, if you have followed me on my Mummy of Four, my main Mummy of Four UK 
YouTube channel or Instagram account for some time now. You probably will have heard some of this before. So apologize if I'm repeating myself, but for the newbies, I've got four children. My second child, so I've got uh, two boys and then two girls. My second child, my youngest son, uh, presented in what now seems quite obvious. I think hindsight's twenty twenty, isn't it? But he had what's known as spiky development, where he was very advanced in some areas and sort of not uh, struggling more than in other areas. So, for example, he could read. When he started school, just after his third birthday, he could read really well. But his uh, chatting, his conversation, his understanding wasn't up to the level of that reading. So that is known as spiky development where it's not consistent across the board. So if you're struggling with everything or you're like excelling at everything, that would be consistent development as opposed to spiky development. So he had this very spiky development uh, where I think at the time I knew that I was the only one that kind of understood his needs at the time. Um, And if you've met William now, honestly, he is the chattiest kid, um, everything that kind of has been put in place. He has just blossomed into such a wonderful young man. If you, probably the most you'll see of Will will be over on my Disney channel. I've got a a Disney channel where we share Disney vlogs um, called Mummy of Four Does Disney. And if you've seen him over there, then you'll know we call him Willipedia because he just knows everything. But he he is so different from that that little three-year-old that... I could understand, but no one else really could understand his needs. And I feel like I didn't realise how bad, how much he struggled then um, until I was seeing him be assessed through like the one way glass of like a mirror, you know, like um, like they use him, like <laughs> using police, I suppose, where he could just see a mirror and I could see him until I could see that how much I was kind of helping him to understand one of the people trying to communicate with him. So getting back to the question did you tell your kids they were being assessed at the time William he didn't care about things like that it was just a case of right we're going to do this now and I explained what we were going to do it so I didn't explain it to him at the time he was three but equally he was so different to the girls at three um he just was a little more in his own little world um, with the girls, I expected, I explained that we were going to go and play some games in, um, the name of the place that I just used, um, which obviously I'm not going to share because that shows where we live and I, I don't discuss where we live, but, um, I just said that we're going to go play some games in the name of this place. Um, and I can't remember, did I say to Bella that we were talking about autism then? I can't, I've got to say, I can't remember, but if you go back to that, I did a video where um, I explained about the autism diagnosis process. But again, she was quite young, although she was older than Will. So she was five, I believe. Um, and then I think by the time Zara was going to be assessed, I think there was more discussion and understanding about autism within the children as a group. So I think it was a case of very blasé. Well, like, you know how you guys have autism? We're just going to go and check if Zara does or doesn't have autism. And they're like, yeah, okay. So I think I was a lot better at discussing the whole topic openly with the children by the time Zara went for an assessment. So I think I seem to remember we did discuss it with her. Um, Now, something I don't think I've shared before, um, but um, I had a chat with my eldest who um I don't think I I don't think I shared this because at the time it wasn't something he didn't say don't share this mum but he was not keen on the whole thing so he um was put forward I was convinced he probably had ADHD because of various things I'm not, I'm not going to go into but sort of behaviors let's just say uh, that we're going to go into and then the school actually thought it wasn't ADHD it was autism the autism pathway for him took a really long time. So he knew he was going to these assessments and was very reluctant. And then when he had the diagnosis, um, was very, um, like, sort of, why did you do this to me? It was a little bit resentful. And has since talked endlessly to me about it. And he's actually apologised for for being difficult, as he put it, which obviously I was like, 
don't be silly, you know, you're a teenager, you know, your feelings are your feelings. But the what what happened was he has, as he's got a little bit older, read back over the report and has realised that actually so much of it did make sense. And actually having autism is just one of those things. And he always just, he never thought of it as a bad thing for the children. He sort of just didn't want it for himself. But having understood that it's just one of those things, it's just how his brain's wired and sort of having, I guess, come to terms with that. He's just very blasé about it now. Um, I have apologised to him endlessly because I feel so guilty that he wasn't flagged as needing assessment till he was in secondary school. And I feel that he's had to struggle so much more with things that the little ones never will have to struggle with, with understanding, even with understanding from me. I can remember when I had him, he was really little. And I remember thinking, I've got sisters, so I've got two sisters, no brothers. I remember thinking, wow, I love you so much. I would like you're my absolute world but I do not understand I do not understand you like as he became a toddler I just thought wow men are from Mars women are from Venus it's so true like I love you but I do not understand your behavior I just don't get it at all so obviously now a lot of the things I look back on with hindsight can be explained with autism and I feel really guilty which he's told me is ridiculous and I'm aware when I say it loud it's ridiculous but I feel really guilty that he didn't have the opportunity to have an assessment and then obviously he would have got a diagnosis because he got it now he's older but to be assessed to see if he had any of these additional needs but in my defense I didn't know enough about it so to me I had only seen so this is like way way back I don't think there was much understanding of autism and I thought autism I thought of it as someone that was completely non-verbal and just didn't sort of talk to anyone integrate at all and that that was my very wrong understanding of autism at the time just through lack of education lack of understanding lack of awareness but I think um that was pretty typical of the time and I think with Will I was like is it but it isn't and I sort of did more and more and more research and then it was only because I'd done so much research with Will that the girls were ever picked up. And I feel like my eldest wasn't as obvious as Will. He was more like the girls level of obvious, which was something that you could only see if you really were looking for it until then, you know, and then you can't unsee it. Like, does that make sense? So because he wasn't obvious enough, he wasn't troublesome in school at a young age, it just wasn't picked up and I just didn't know enough to pick it up just having a quick drink we'll be back after a quick break are you fed up of feeling crazy busy and super disorganized all the time well I've got you covered with my new organized life planner which is here to help you get your life back on track with a yearly overview, weekly planning, daily planning, task prioritizing, meal planning, birthday planning, weekly reflections, journaling, notes and more, this planner is perfect for busy mums who want to get organized and stay motivated. Get your copy now in digital or printed format and start planning your life today by visiting mummyof4.com forward slash planner or using the link down in the show notes. Anyway, um, so did you tell our kids you were being assessed? Obviously, my eldest was told because he was a teenager, so so new. Um, Did uh, another question I had was how long did it take to get the assessment? I'm starting with my 11 year old. So I think as I touched on at the beginning, it's really going to vary, not even just country to country, but sort of trust to hospital trust to hospital trust, I understand, or school maybe county to county, I don't think it's as consistent as it should be. So how it worked with us was when the children were under five, and again, there's a massive long playlist on my main Mummy of 4 UK um, channel on YouTube where I vlogged at the time and I can remember like 
probably a fraction of what I've put in those videos, which is why I kind of recorded it at the time. Um, but basically, the children under the age of five went through the health visitor and the NHS system. Then there's this funny gap during the school years where it's through the educational psychologist and through the education system, which is slow and clunky. So it took, gosh, I can't even remember how old my eldest was when he was referred, but he wasn't diagnosed till he was 17. So I'm guessing, I think it was about three or four years before he was even assessed, which is just such a long time, especially if you've got a child that you're, you have concerns about and that they're struggling. It's just, it, it's too long. It's, you know, I could rave about that all day, but it, it was too long. Now, I'm not saying that would be the case with everywhere. And bizarrely then, obviously, when you leave the school system and you're an adult, if you need to get an assessment and you go to the GP and you're back through the health system. So it is just an odd, odd way of, of doing it. But that's how it currently works at the moment where I am in Wales. Um, so just, like I say, speak to your GP, speak to your school if you have any concerns and find out what the pathway is, where it, what is the current pathway and what are the waiting times? But unfortunately, it's too long. People can go privately, but please do make sure um, if you are going privately that the person you're going to will be recognised by the NHS because I have heard horror stories of people paying a lot of money to get an assessment and then it's not recognised by any official bodies. And obviously that's really, really problematic because you've paid all this money and you, you can't do anything with it to access any help for your child. So that's a nightmare. Um, so... Next question. Um, some, so many questions, by the way, sent in. I will try and get to as many as possible today, but I think some of these actually need their entire own episode. So um, do let me know if you're on YouTube. Just leave me a little comment if there are any specific questions you want to go deeper on. If you have any specific questions um, or if you're listening to the podcast, then you can email me re at mummyof4.com. Uh, all the details will be down below um, with your question that I can answer in a future episode. So what signs do you notice in the children that made you think they have autism? Um, so with Will, I think I touched on this, it was the spiky development. It was the fact that he was clearly so academically brilliant, really, but didn't want to communicate, did um, a certain amount of stimming, things that he doesn't do anymore, um, like twirling his hair and a lot of running in circles. A lot of stuff that I just thought was a boy thing, but clearly perhaps some of that was an ASD thing um but the, yeah the biggest one was not wanting to communicate at all even though he was very 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 bright um and just little things like sensory things uh refusing to wear shoes indoors at all so yeah it like please do if you take if you come visit my house and you want to take off your shoes at the door then I'm very grateful it's less cleaning for me fab however I'm talking like we couldn't go into the post office or Costa without him taking off his shoes it was it was a whole thing um obviously it's mad to ever think this because I couldn't imagine him being anything other than like that and now obviously he'll wear shoes wherever he, wherever it's required um so for the girls it was a lot more subtle and the next question I've got here is were any of the children diagnosed deep in the school though the school had no concerns with my girls the school had no concerns none because girls especially and I'm not saying only girls do this because obviously boys can do it too but masking is such a massive issue with girls it, and it's an issue because then perhaps you're seeing things the school will never see and then you're made to feel almost like am I imagining things is this all in my head and then you've got this this report where like well there's no issues at all in school because often autism in girls and um, can just kind of be presented as being quiet which let's face it if you've got a class full of kids which ones are going to be more of a problem as a teacher are they going to be the quiet kids no they're going to be your easy kids or are they going to be the bouncing off the walls kids which are generally and this is a very general speaking because obviously boys and girls can go either way but generally typically uh, more boys with autism will display more sort of um, obvious or boisterous behaviors and girls with autism will generally just be a bit more quiet and withdrawn. So just less likely to be spotted because they're not problematic to the teacher. So, yes, the children, uh, the girls were diagnosed. Um, the, the school uh, sort of agreed to support the assessments. 
uh, even though they didn't have any concerns and they reported that they didn't have any concerns. They put down anything that they could think of that had happened, but they really weren't worried. And then obviously both girls came back with the diagnosis. Um, so for the girls, it was more kind of rigid behaviours and meltdowns that we were seeing behind closed doors. A lot of overwhelm, especially after school, concerns about changes in routine. So similar things that lots of people with autism experience, but seen in a kind of, I'll hold it together all day in school and then it will just all come out at you. And I'd often get it as they were coming out of the doors. Like, they would barely make it out of the playground, you know? Um, and I would say that for the girls, their difficulties have increased as they, they got older. They they face more social challenges and school gets trickier and things. And I, I think this was my concern. What I really wanted from an assessment was first to know, is this all in my head? Or should I be parenting my children as if they have autism? Should they be helped by accessing for them? Or am I just seeing things that aren't there because I've had one child diagnosed? And I needed to know that for myself. I needed to know how best to parent them. And I'd heard horror stories about girls being diagnosed with autism in their teen years and just or not even being diagnosed until later than that. And then looking back with hindsight, having been very withdrawn and felt very depressed because they just didn't feel like they fit in and they didn't quite understand why. And I think the biggest takeaway I wanted for my children once they had a diagnosis was, yeah, okay, I am a little different, not in a bad way. My brain might be wired a little different to some of my neurotypical friends. So I don't need to look for why do I feel different. It's like, well, that's just, we just think in slightly different ways. It doesn't mean we can't be friends. And I think that acceptance of our differences can make us feel calmer and less stressed out than if we're wondering why and we can't put a finger on why do I feel different and why do I not fit in. If it can just be, well, do you know what? Sometimes I, you know, I get stressed out. So talking for my children, you know, sometimes I get stressed out in cues because of autism or, and then some of their friends are like, well, sometimes I can't, I struggle with reading because of dyslexia. And there's just, everyone's got their struggles, you know, everyone's got their struggles. Um, so any strategies to help the girls regulate, especially before and after school? Um, yes, we do have lots of different ones. Um, so routine is massively important. Now, when the girls had their diagnoses, I guess, plural of diagnosis, um, it was said that because we had so much routine in place already for Will, and to be honest, routine is just a productivity hack. When you've got lots of children, having routine is a way of juggling and keeping more balls in the air and dropping fewer of them. So I find anyway. So because I had so much routine in place, they were already a lot. We'll be back after a quick break. Are you super busy with just no time to sit and read? Audible has the perfect solution for you. With Audible, you can listen to your favourite books from self-development to novels while you go about your day-to-day -day tasks. Multitasking like a pro. Make mundane moments in life more enjoyable with Audible. Get your first book free today and start listening by using the link in my show notes or typing mummyof4.com forward slash audible into your browser now. That one book is yours to keep even if you cancel your subscription. So make sure you grab yours now. like a lot of the stuff I would have put in place them after a diagnosis was already in place. And I'd been parenting them that way since they were very, very small or since Zara was born because that's how I parent all of my children. Because I've got to say, um, and actually, I don't know, perhaps someone else can chip in who, who knows the answer to this actually, because thinking about it, I don't know about parenting neurotypical children because I only have neurodivergent children. So... <laughs> But I assume <laughs> that all of the tips that people give for parenting kids with autism are just good parenting sense. And that is, that's the kind of the stuff that as I was reading it, the more I've done my research, the more I've put in place, I thought, wow, this, this stuff just kind of makes sense. You know, a lot of it 
would make sense for most children. I have done videos on my main channel about calming techniques. Um, perhaps we'll let me know if you want to have a podcast in more depth about calming techniques, um, because a lot of the calming techniques that work for kids with autism also work for neurotypical kids that are dealing with something or that have been anxious or whatever. So a lot of the a lot of these things work anyway. So routine is a massive one. I think routine often helps children feel secure to know that things are predictable. Um, some of the things that then work though, one of the things that's a little contradictory to that is switching up context if there's a meltdown going on. So for example, if, um, if we get home and it's the weather's not been great and the day's not been good and there's, we get home, there's a meltdown going on. Sometimes I will switch things up totally and be like, right, we're going to get out of the clothes we're in now. We're going to put on snuggly pajamas and we're going to, we're going to change things in our environment. And that way we can help to change our mood. We're going to make things cozy. We're going to make things lovely. Or if we're doing a piece of homework and it's causing a meltdown as homework often can, we will shelve that and put it aside and set a time and agree a time we're going to go back to that, but we'll move away from it and do something totally different. Sometimes getting out of the house, going for a walk, just even just changing which room we're in can make a massive difference. Um, the other thing that really calms them is Mickey and Minnie cartoons on Disney+. Plus. Honestly, if you can find like comfort TV that your kids always zone into, then obviously my kids are massive Disney fans, that works for them. Um, the Mickey and Minnie story compilation audiobook, which is really, really long, um, really helps to calm them in the evenings, before bed, for the girls, they listen to that all the time. So yeah, lots and lots of different things. Um, and then of course, a very tight hug. If you've ever seen Grey's Anatomy, there's an episode um, where, where they talk about that. Um, but yeah, a really tight hug kind of helps to make everything go, ah, oh, and just regulate their system. Um, but different thing, and it's a bizarre thing because it's like you need a lot in your toolkit because sometimes things that will work beautifully won't work the next day or will work one child and not another. So you just need lots of things up your sleeve ready to pull out and try. And I can definitely go into that in more detail. I have done before. I can go into that in more detail here on the podcast if that is something you want to hear about. Okay, so um, is stimming a sign of autism? Also, do I tell him not to do it or let him stim? So yes, stimming is a sign of autism, but it doesn't mean your child has autism because on its own, with no other challenges or difficulties, it doesn't necessarily indicate autism. Um, it's definitely something to, to flag up. And if it is paired with other challenges, then it could mean your child has autism. But I can't tell you that. Only an assessment can tell you that. And it's funny because even when my kids have had assessments and I've talked to the assessors, they'll say, do you know what, until I add this up, I can't tell you. I can't tell you this is going to come out. It's like a mathematical formula where they score different numbers in different activities. And they're just honestly like genuinely, I couldn't call it until I do the math, which if even a professional can't tell you until you've done the maths, then you as a parent can't guess that. I can't tell you that. Um, one thing I will say though, is that you're never going to regret getting your child's name down on a list. You might regret not doing it. If like worst case scenario, you put your child down for an assessment, they go through an assessment, which is not intrusive. It's not like a medical thing. There's no needles. It's, you know, it's often looking at books and stacking things or there's cars involved or blocks or, you know, it's, it's an essentially from what I witnessed from my children's assessments, they weren't upset at all. They were essentially playing with toys with, with nice people. So they're never going to, I say never, some children might be, but my children weren't stressed out by the actual assessment process. So even if they'd come out and they said, well, there's no autism here, then you're typical, then I wouldn't have regretted having gone through that because it would have put my mind at rest that I had sort of done what I felt needed to be done and just got it checked. I'd always rather when it comes to my children get things checked rather than not get things checked. So if anyone ever messages me and says, Re, what should I do? Should I get them assessed? My answer is always, if you're asking me, then the answer is you need to look into it. Um, 
Obviously, if there are financial implications involved, if you're in a country where you'd have to pay for that yourself, if you that would, you know, cause you massive detriment financially, that is a very different situation. And that is a call that you're going to have to make for yourself. But if this is going to be through the schools or through the NHS, it's not actually going to cost you anything. But delaying getting your name on a very long waiting list might be a decision you regret because remember ultimately if you put your child's name down and in three years they come back to you go right it's your turn to be assessed you could you could say look give my, give the place to someone else because we don't have any concerns anymore three years is such a long time and not every assessment takes three years to come around but some do and if it's going to take that long which it may your child's going to change a lot. You're going to change a lot. The situation's going to change a lot in that time. And you'll either be thinking, well, oh, that was something or nothing. We don't need this. You know, give the place to someone else. Or you'll be thinking, oh, thank God I put the name down because things have changed and escalated so much in that time. And if I hadn't, we'd be starting from scratch now. It'd be another three years down the line. So yeah, that's <laughs> that was not what was asked. Is stimming a sign of autism was what was asked. Gosh, I went on a right tangent there. Um, and also, do I tell him not to or let him stim? Um, I think it depends what the stimming is. So if the stimming is causing danger, then I would perhaps redirect it. And I'm not suggesting that you ever tell a child that stimming not to stim at all, but there are certain times that we do try and redirect the children to something more appropriate to the environment we're in at the time. So um, one of them, for example, loves to bounce off the furniture, which I discourage because it has historically led to accidents. Um, lots of bumped heads and scrapes and all sorts. Uh, so I do believe it's a stimming thing, so we try and redirect that into something else. So fidget toys, um, something you can teach them to do, um, perhaps in school sitting under the table that's less obvious, um, that's going to, to draw less attention if you're in crowded places and that's not something they'll, you know, I mean, maybe it's not something that bothers you, but if it, there are certain, uh, situations where you can perhaps redirect them, but mainly if it's dangerous, if it's not causing anyone any harm, I say just leave them to it because where's the harm? But yeah, it's just, if there is any danger, uh, for example, Will used, did used to get his finger caught in his hair quite a lot. So we'd try and redirect that so that he didn't get upset with caught, you know, literally finger tangled in hair. Um, right, next question. London trip, theatres and autism, how do you do it? Uh, right, so if you don't know, uh, we went to London. Let me see. At the time of recording, it was last weekend. There are London vlogs coming out on my channel if you want lots of information about that trip it was fabulous uh, we went to see Hamilton I got to go to the Charlotte Tilbury shop the girls went to see Pineapple Studios the boys went to the London Transport Museum we had a we had a blast so how do we do trips like this planning planning preparation preparation planning planning preparation preparation so I hope that my vlogs are helpful to other people especially people with autism planning trips because often I show my children videos on YouTube about places we're going to go. So one of the reasons we went to the Pineapple Studios is I'd like the girls to do some classes there. They love their dancing and they do workshops for children aged seven and over. So Zara's six, when she turns seven in early next year, then the girls perhaps next summer can go and do those workshops. But I wanted them to physically go and see the space and that way they could understand it and they're far more likely to actually enjoy the experience than if I just showed up there and was like, in you go. So for London, we looked at lots of vlogs, lots of planning. I always make sure um, when we're doing trips that I've got everything put out in the calendar. It's a shared family calendar so the children can look at that too. And I go over them over and over and over with them. What we're going to do first and then next. We do discuss that obviously plans could change um, because obviously we don't want meltdowns with, with, with that happening too. We try and remind them that we have to be somewhat flexible but it helps them to know where we're going, what it's going to look like, what will be expected of them, when we'll eat food. They look at menus in advance. They look at pictures of the theatre in advance. So we went to see Hamilton. They knew that soundtrack inside out and they loved it more for it. I know some people are like, no, no spoilers. That's not my kids. Um, some people love doing the, hey, we're going to Disney today. Um, my children, that that's not for them. That's not for them. They might enjoy that now that they've been so many times before, but to be honest, they love the planning so much because 
I think it's because it helps them. It helps them get excited for longer, but also it helps them enjoy it more when they're there. I think the way that my children have autism, and I don't know if this is autism generally or if this is just my kids, but um, there's something called the RAS, the Reticular Activating System, which kind of filters what you pay attention to in your brain. And the example you always hear is if you think of buying a red car then suddenly you see red cars everywhere you think of buying a certain model of car suddenly you see them everywhere there are not more of those cars suddenly it's just your brain is suddenly more aware of them and I think for neurotypical people your reticular activating system is you know in a neutral position where you're able to filter out stuff you don't especially need um to notice or remember now I find with my children it's like they take in a bit too much it's like the level is shifted So they will take in such minute details and that must be so exhausting going to a brand new place and having to take everything in for the first time. However, when they return somewhere or they've been planning and preparing and they know where they're going, they're like, okay, so we're back in Disney, for example. We're back in Disney. Castle's the same, familiar with all this. Oh, okay, but it's Christmas. There's a Christmas tree. There's, and to be honest, I will have shown them Christmas things as well, but they will just then notice the smaller details without having to take in every single detail. It's almost like they've got, not necessarily photographic memories, but close to a photographic memory. And like they're studying for a test and they have to take in everything. And having to do that from scratch every time must be exhausting. And I think that by preparing them in advance, that is how we do a lot better. We also always have a lot of stuff with us, something for them to do when they're bored, when they're waiting. They've always got drinks, they've always got colouring, they've always got pens, uh, a device, you know, there's a lot of preparation that goes with the planning. So we're preparing the children, but also preparing the things. There's always snacks. There's always snacks. Because you don't want hangry children. You really, really don't, whether they have ASD or not. So how do we do it all? Um, that's how we do it all. There's always information generally for most places you go, how, you know, for places that are um, disability friendly. Um, so it's just do any research and then involving your kids with the planning as much as possible. Generally, in my experience, makes for a much smoother trip. Um, and then I've got a comment just saying, I want to say how thank you I am that I found your channel and all of the helpful tips you give. That's so, so kind. And then the rest of the question is, disruption and changes to routine for a weekend or away. Are there any meltdowns afterwards? There can be, yes, uh, because returning to routine can be challenging. But I don't regret taking them on those trips and giving those them those experiences because to be honest you could be blindsided with a meltdown anyway over something you just can't see coming there is only a certain amount of planning and preparation you can do and hopefully the planning and preparation covers most eventualities but sometimes you just you get blindsided by things that that you can't see coming I can remember one of them when they were little was really upset because the the brand of soap I was buying we used to, we have hand soap into dispensers now but, but I used to buy just the bottles um and the hand soap said something different on it and that was really upsetting or like if the toothpaste label or whatever is different you know if, if a brand changes their branding like you can't control that <laughs> or if something's out of stock which is why I always have back stock of things but if something that your kids normally eat or like is out of stock sometimes those things are out of our control so sometimes you can deal with meltdowns even with the you know the best planning and intentions in the world so I'll never regret taking my children to do those things and have those experiences because generally when we've planned really really well then there are minimal meltdowns and I see those meltdowns coming um in advance and sometimes I do kind of just if we're away I say to my husband look they need time to withdraw and chill out now we need to go back to the room take off their shoes and socks put their feet on the floor and just decompress and then we can kind of go back out and carry on and that's what we do often but if we don't give the children those experiences they're also experiences to learn and experiences to to challenge them and sort of help to prepare them because as much as I want to make provisions for my kids to help them with challenges that they face I also know that the one day they're going to be in the big bad world without me and there's it's finding that very delicate balance between making provisions for them to make sure they're comfortable and safe and happy all the time, which is obviously what I want as a mother, but also challenging them enough that they're prepared enough for the world and for school and for jobs and for all those things. And I think that's a challenge that that most parents 
face in some way, especially parenting children who are neurodiverse. So I hope that this has been helpful in some way. Um, I'd love to know if there are any extra questions. I'm sorry I didn't get to all of them, um, but we would literally be here all day. Um, if there are specific questions that you would like answered, I am thinking about doing deep dive podcasts on specific questions um, and other obviously not just about autism but about other things please do uh, follow me at real talk with re podcast i think it's called on instagram and all the details will be down below in the description the show notes um, of where you can find me how you can get in touch with your own questions if you have enjoyed this podcast please do like and subscribe and share over on youtube snap a little pic of what you're doing while you're listening and share it in stories tagging me over on Instagram, either Mummy of 4UK or Real Talk with Read Podcast, um, or both, both, you know, just get tagging and get tagging so I can get sharing. So thanks so much for joining me. I'll see you in the next episode of Real Talk with Read.